Oh boy, I'm like, all the stuff that's been broiling, broiling around in my head for like broiling, boiling, broiling, it depends on how you like to cook, right? I don't like boiled food, so let's go with broil. The stuff that's been broiling around in my head for the last few months. Um, I think I've shared this with a handful of people, I don't know how many. Who has heard about my crazy experience in Reading in November? Any, like, raise your hand if you have. We've got, oh, so only a few of you. Okay, I got messed up. I blame God, and now you get what got messed up, okay? Um, and I'm going to explain a little bit of what happened. And then I'll jump into what I want to share today. Um, I'm that dude. I grew up in the church. You guys know most of my story, so I won't go through it. Of all of the years of being in charismatic circles and the revivals and all the stuff that I've been a part of, I have fallen down in the Holy Spirit once. Like, and, and I didn't enjoy that. You know when all your friends are on the ground and you're the last guy standing in, like, church and you're like, oh, man, this is just like, I, I, I'm not the guy. Like, it, I will not fake it. I, I've never been able to fake it. So I don't know if my friends were faking it or not. Part of me believed that they might have been because, you know, the most popular kid goes down and everybody else is like, oh, and they hit the ground. And you're like, you got up, like, two seconds after you hit the ground. I don't know if that was legit or not. But I, I couldn't fake it. I was never the faking kind. And, and so the first time I ever hit the ground was about 20 years ago. Uh, Randy Clark came to our church in Rochester, New York. And he likes to be in the, in, if you don't know who Randy Clark is, healing. Just look him up and you'll learn so much about healing. And I'm there in the crowd, actually, in the front, because he, he had everyone come up for prayer that wanted, like, impartation for healing. And he starts just walking through the whole crowd, man. He, he, he's, like, intent on laying hands on, like, all 3,000 people that were there. And I'm like, oh, I love that about him. And I'm just there on the peripheral, and eventually he comes near me, and he puts his hand on me, and I experience something I've never experienced before. My legs start to buckle. I'm like, I'm a very healthy 22-year-old guy at this point in time. And I, I can't stand up. Suddenly I'm like, I'm in my mind, I'm like, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? And he doesn't, he just gently puts his hand on He doesn't care a lick because there's all kinds of stuff happening. He just keeps going. Next thing I know, I'm on the ground. I'm crying. I'm feeling like, what just happened? God just touched me. I didn't expect that. This hasn't happened yet. Even my biggest encounter at 15 years old I didn't go down. I'm like standing there at the front of the church like having this crazy power encounter. There's kids laid out everywhere and I'm like, eh, I don't care. I'm not down, but I feel good and God's with me. And so that was the first time that I went down and then nothing. Like no, no speakers came and I went down, nothing. Like I went 20 years and then, and then, uh, and I wanted to. Like Bill and Chris would go through the entire school at BSSM, Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry and they do impartation. Everybody's going down. You know what guy's not going down? <laughs> this guy's not going down. Even with Bill praying for me, I'm not going down. And I, I wanted to. Like, I wanted to so bad. I don't want to be the last guy standing in these things. So I'm like, oh, man, they must be getting some kind of crazy impartation. And I'm over here like a pillar in the house of God, not moving, can't tear this thing down. <sighs> Lo and behold, so we went out to Reading twice in November, once for the marriage retreat, and then before the marriage retreat uh, with Barry and Lori, we were out there to do a leaders conference. And at the end of the leaders conference, they asked us come, to come speak to all, a, a bunch of the Bethel School students that, wanted, that were in the church leadership and planting track. And so we have this blow-up session. Jessica and I are like killing it. It just went really well. And they end up doing breakout rooms, and we go into this breakout room, and a ton of these students, like we fill the place up to overflowing, release like all kinds of cool details about church leadership. And at the end, they're like, can we pray for you? And I, we get that like a million times every time we're there. And I'm like, yeah, come on, this is going to be great. I can feel the joy. I can feel the presence. Light us up. So uh, J Jessica and I stand in the middle. They start praying for us. And it's like they've been praying for like five-ish minutes or so. And then suddenly I feel these, these two hands come on my back. And something begins to happen my legs begin to buckle. This was, this was November, first week in November-ish, and I start stumbling, trying to hold it up, and I'm going backwards, and I'm starting to shout out, I don't know what's happening! I'm saying this out loud, I don't know what's going on! And suddenly, I just, I, I like, my legs crumple, and I go down, and they catch me, and put me onto the couch. And so I'm sitting there on the couch, 
from the moment that, that that started to happen, I suddenly start like weeping, like uncontrollable, like weeping, and I feel my heart breaking inside of me. Not, not my physical heart, but this like, this crazy breaking and weeping. And the whole time I'm like, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's happening. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, God, I don't care. It's you. Like, I'll take more of it, whatever it is. And I, and I am, for those who know what I mean when I say I'm getting drunk, I'm getting drunk too, like spiritually drunk in the time that I'm also on the ground. And so my words are going from being clear, like, I love you, to like, I love you. Like, if you've been around drunk people, which I, I've had a lot of family, and so we've experienced all kinds of stuff, and you know what drunk people get like. And I'm sitting there like, I'm, I'm a hot mess, like more of a hot mess than I have ever been. This was amazing to me, and I don't know what's happening. I don't have a clue. There's like nothing inside where God's like, this is what I'm doing, and this is what I'm releasing to you. You know how people like get visions, and they're like, oh man, when I went out, God did this, and he said this, and all. I'm just over there like, <laughs> and I'm the last person left in the room, and one of the students, Abe, he's going to be here in March, by the way, when, they, when all the students come for their inter, or the, the mission trip here. He ends up being like, he has to carry me back into the final session like, because I, I can't walk. And so he like picks me up and he like drags me into the last session and it's just like this Holy Spirit romper party. Not rompers, rompers are, don't wear rompers, okay? If those ever come back in, we need to like rebuke the devil and make them flee. But I'm, some people love them. Eleanor's, Eleanor's laughing. Do you like rompers, my daughter? No, thank God. If Eleanor likes it, it's in style. That's why I ask. If she doesn't, then I run away from it. So... There's this Holy Spirit party that is just like breaking out in this room, and it's awesome, and it's cool. At the end of it, all the students, uh, a whole bunch of the students wanted to talk to Jessica and I, so we stay there. We just love to individually engage with them and, and, and pray and go through all these great conversations. And there's this one student just hanging out on the peripheral the entire time, and he waits till everybody's gone, and then he comes up to me. And he's Dutch. I'm going to butcher the Dutch accent, and it's going to sound German. You just got to deal with it. He comes up to me, and he's like, hi, do you know what's happened to you? And I'm like, I don't, man. I don't know what's going on. Oh, he's like, oh, can I share with you what happened to you? I was the one who put my hands on you. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, well, yes, please tell me what happened to me. Like, what, is, what was God telling you for me? And I want to preface it by saying this. Before we went out to Reading, Jessica came to me, and she does this every time. She's like, ask God for something when we go there. Ask him for something, because every time we go out there, he, he blesses us big in some way. Like, ask him for something. And I said, okay. I went, and I prayed, and I sat down with, with, with God, and I said, you know what I want? I, I desperately want more of your heart. I want the ability to be more compassionate, more empathetic. I want the ability to, to the, the heart to be able to see people the way that you see them in a way that I never have before. I want to be a pastor in a way that I've never felt before. I want, I want to do this really well. And, and it's been this thing that has been burning inside of me even before she asked me. So that's what I asked. So back to John from the, the Netherlands. He says, well, this is what God told me for you. I am expanding your heart. I, 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 I am breaking your heart because I'm giving you more of my heart for, for this season and for your people. And he goes and he explains a little bit more. And I'm just a mess. I'm like... That's what God was doing. He actually answered my prayer, which goes to tell you, ask some prayers. When you go to into conferences and stuff and you want to receive something from God, Jessica has taught me, ask for something. Like, don't just go there expecting to receive willy-nilly whatever you can get. Like, if there's something you want, ask for it. And so I got that crazy breaking heart, weeping thing. It was huge. And from November until currently, and I'm sure it's going to continue to go on, there has been a massive change inside of me. Like, I hate phone calls with people. Despise it. Like, even people I'm really comfortable with, I don't like getting on the phone with them. It always feels awkward. It feels forced. It feels like, I don't know if God created this or the devil created this phone because it doesn't feel right. And so I didn't like phone calls. Now, I make so many phone calls in a day, and I look forward to them. I know you're like, that's your litmus test? Like, for God broke your heart and, and gave you his? I'm like, yeah, actually, that was a huge litmus test for me. I'm like, I can't wait to call people. Like, that's so weird. Oh, thanks for clapping, guys. It's like the kid getting the gold stars. I'm like, <laughs> I'll go get my stickers and put them on. And 
there have been many, many other occasions where things have happened and I notice that my heart turns towards people differently than it ever has before in my life. And so all of that to get to what I'm going to share today in 15 minutes. Jesus, help us. Now that I've been in children's church so much, being on time here means a lot. Anybody that works in children's church, you know exactly what I am talking about right now. It's like, so the pastor's still going, huh? <laughs> it's 1220. I'm like, oh God, help us be prepared for a crazy revival. <laughs> or if you're down there with little kids down in the, the apple orchard. Um, so I'm going to do my best to make this, this function and flow. Oh, as soon as I get my password in here, right? So in the midst of this, thing that God was doing with my heart, what he was speaking to me, um, he brought back a verse to me that has been one of the most troubling verses of my life until recently. And it's, you're, you're going you're gonna to hear me say it, and you're going to be like, if that's your most troubling verse, I'm not sure if you're okay, because it seems very simple. But I'm going to explain it to you anyways. Um, da -da -da. Let me get my Bible out here. Got to make this legal for you guys. I know people sometimes get on my case because I don't use my Bible and I just preach from my heart and like Jesus did. <laughs> and that's okay. I still love you. I know, I'm going to get myself in trouble. It's what I do and I don't mind it. Okay, John 15, verse 13. Why don't you jump there if you have your Bibles. Jump there if you have your phones. One of the two, I'll wait. I'm patient. If you don't know where John is, it's in the tail half of the Bible. New Testament. One of my favorite books. Hands down, probably is my favorite book in the Bible. And I'm probably going to explain to you a little bit why. So many of you know this verse and you know it by heart, but I'm going to share it to you anyways. Greater love has no one than this. I did, didn't I? John 15, 13, yes. It just goes to show you my wife doesn't listen to me. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. She's actually one of the best listeners I know. I shouldn't throw her under the bus like that. One of the best listeners I know. Um, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. That verse perplexed me for my entire life. You're like, what? Because I sat there with that verse being like, greater love has no one than he laid down his life for his friends. Like, what about a spouse? Like, why didn't he be like, greater love has no one than this, that you lay down your life for your spouse? Or, I mean, if that's difficult, because you got it, that spouse, like, what about greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his kids? Like, that seems like it makes sense, right? I don't know, I don't know any parent out there that wouldn't be like, I'll take the bullet, I'll take the hit, I'll get in the way. I don't know a parent, and if I do know you, and that's not your stance, I'll, I'll rip you a new one until it becomes your stance. But in my mind, it didn't make sense. It didn't make sense to me with the revelation that I was getting from like going through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and, and, and hearing God talk about the, or Jesus talk about the Father, the Father, the love of the Father, like all this stuff about the Father. And then I get to this point and I have this verse, no greater love is a man than this, that he laid down his life for his friend. I'm like, oh, that's weak. I wanted something like meteor for love than that and and jesus brought me back to it and he's like okay let's talk about this verse with everything that just happened to you and this whole new heart that i'm giving you and so in that place i began to realize and i'm going to make a few statements to you i began to realize friendship is the greatest goal for everybody and, I wanna, and I'll, I'll make this statement because I've made it before and a lot of you haven't heard me, but before I say it, I'll say this. I hate discipleship programs with a passion. I've never been a part of a successful one and I grew up in the church. Meaning, they gave you all kinds of good information, but I did not walk out of them feeling like a disciple of anybody. Nonetheless, Jesus. And I, anybody been, no, don't raise your hands. I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, any leaders or anything else, but just to say that I despised them. And then when I read this verse, Jesus said this thing to me that is now like tattooed on my heart. I love tattoos. Someday maybe I'll get a full sleeve, but I don't know. That might scare people. 
If it scares religious people, then maybe I should do it. That would be the best. Um, but he said this line, and it has stuck with me deeply, and he said, if discipleship doesn't end in friendship, it's a failure. And this was the context. He said, when did I speak these words? Where? And I said, you spoke those words to your core group of disciples right before you headed to the cross. And I want to take you to another verse that is right there too, right after that. Verse 14. You are my friends if you do what I command you. What's the command, by the way? Well, I was really, I'm like, from up here, I want to tell you what that sounded like. It sounded like this. Love. I'm like, what? It says, Jesus gives them a whole new command that actually, it takes the entire Old Testament and the law, shuffles it out of the way because the law is based on your ability to make it happen, and he gives a new law, the law of his kingdom. What's the new law? I heard it nice and clear that time. Better, clearer. Love others as I have loved you. What do you first have to do in that place? You and I, what do you first have to do? You don't love God at all. You have received, you actually have to receive the love of Christ in that place. He didn't demand that they loved him first. He actually said, I'm going to love you like crazy and once you've experienced my love, go love other people that way. You guys get me? So often in the church, we're like, you gotta, you gotta and I'm gonna, and I, I will continue to tell you this verse because I know it screws people up. People are like, well, what about that part in the Bible where Jesus is talking with the, the ruler and he's like, hey, what are the two greatest commandments in the Bible? And Jesus responds to him, the two greatest commandments are love the Lord your God with all your heart and everything and then love your neighbor as yourself. Who is the requirement on to love? Who, like, who has to be doing the loving? Us. We're doing the loving. That's the law. Guess what Jesus did? He fulfilled it and got rid of it. Hebrews tells us he actually does away with the old system. What's part of the old system? The Ten Commandments are part of the old system. They're great. They're good truths. But they're not enough. Because you're still going to go out there and you're going to steal. You're going to covet your neighbor's spouse. Shame, shame, shame. You're going to kill somebody. Well, let's hope not. Like, like, it's all on you. How many laws were there? 606, huh? 613, I always forget that. 613 laws. And guess who's got to fulfill every single one of them if you want to be considered holy and righteous and pious? Just stop it. Not yet, Joey. Don't answer like that. <laughs> it's the right answer, but stop it. We kind of actually teach people, we bring them back into that Old Testament law and we'll be like, we take that, that, that scripture where Jesus is talking to that, that ruler. That ruler comes to him and says, what are the two greatest commandments in the law of Moses? And Jesus tells him, he responds to him and says, these are the two greatest commandments. Jesus doesn't say those are my commandments. He doesn't say it. He's like, that's the law. Here's the two greatest commandments in the law. And the law's on you. Well, Joey made it right, but we're not going to get into the theological stuff that deep today. And then Jesus comes and fulfills all those commandments, and he says, I fulfilled them so I could get rid of them. Because none of you were able to do it. I could do it. I could do it. And he said, I'm giving you something far simpler. You don't have 613 anymore. You got one. What's his one? I want, to, I want to get this so ingrained inside of you. Love others as I have loved you. What do you got to do first? You got to actually just say, I receive your love. All it takes is a yes to him because you can't love for crap. <laughs> Anybody that's married, you know it. Anybody that's had kids that test your everything, you know it. You suddenly are like, oh my gosh, I need some kind of miraculous love or I will kill this person. <laughs> you guys think it's crazy. Then you see stuff on the news channel and you're like, I, I can kind of understand how that happened. 
It's, it's the extreme of it, but at the same time, you can't love for garbage until you've received a love that is better than anything you've ever tasted. And then suddenly, once you've tasted of that love, you're able to do something that you were never able to do before. Because you're no longer loving based on your strength. You're bringing who along with you. I know, I like to ask questions. I'm in children's church. You know if you don't ask them questions, they gone. If you don't actually ask them questions, they drift into magic land in their minds. And then you lose the whole group of them. And you know what it's like trying to herd cats? That's why I ask you questions. That's why I ask them questions. Because when I ask questions, it helps you stay with me here. But who do you bring with you now? Jesus. I hope you're getting this. So where am I going? I, I, oh, we're doing good on time. Better than I thought. I don't need this. We'll get there. So in this place of this crazy love, Jesus is saying, I give you this commandment. Or he's saying, oh, let me rephrase all this. He has greater love as no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. So the greatest love is friendship. The greatest picture of love is actually friendship. Okay, this is nuts. And you are my friends if I do what I command you. What's, he's, what's he commanding them to do? I'll, well, here, I'll give you the command right there. It's verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. So what is he telling them then? Right there in that moment, he's saying, I'm going to lay my life down for you. That's the greatest expression of this commandment. You, my closest friends, and you're my friends if you do what? Love other people the same way. Anybody convicted yet? You're like, yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't love my friends quite like that yet, or my spouse, or my kids. I want to lay their life down on the altar, but maybe not my own. So this is where I want to jump into verse 15 because this is where it took it to a whole other level for me. And verse 15 says, No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends. For all things that I've heard from my father, I have made known to you. I want to do an example of what this would look like. <sighs> the healthiest marriages, what kind of relationship do the husband and wife share? Yeah. If a marriage doesn't have friendship, man, and I've been there in so many rooms counseling so many marriages. It really has nothing except for a covenant holding it together. And that covenant is strong. There's no love. There's no connection. There's no hearts being shared with every little detail and vulnerability. There's no desire even to be around one another. You can call it marriage, but it's more or less like a march of death. It's like you're dying every day until you finally get to the, the by and by. I'm like, I know why some people want to go to heaven, because their marriages stink. I'm not even kidding with you. And some people are like, I'll never break that covenant. I'm just going to live in this junk until I get to heaven. That's horrible. Next, what is the greatest relationship that I will ever be able to have with my daughter? Some people are getting this. The greatest relationship I will ever be able to carry with that beautiful girl right there is not the simple fact that she is my blood. The fact that she is my blood is why she has to do garbage, why she has to let the dogs out <laughs> when she does. But that is not the strength of our relationship. Jesus even proves that the bloodline is not the strength of a relationship. Jesus even proves I'm adopting everybody that comes. I don't care about your bloodline. But the point being is the greatest relationship I can have with my daughter before she walks out of the doors of my house is what? Because if she calls me friend, I'm always just a phone call away. I'm always the person that she's gonna trust. I'm always the person she'll expect to be there. If I have that with her, I've won at life. Is this making sense a little bit? So in the church, Jesus started with the classic church model. 
Come, be discipled by me. There's no relationship yet when he calls them. He says, come, follow me. And then he spends three years pouring himself into these 12 men and this other group of women that came along with him. Three years. What was the end result of those three years? What did he say to them in that passage? I no longer call you slaves. I call you friends. I lived in the house of God as a slave for most of my life. I'll tell you what, you know what the slave gets? The slave gets the orders of what to do and does them and eventually holds a grudge because of everything the master has that they don't. Jesus makes it really clear, though, as he works all this time with them, I no longer call you that. You aren't a disciple strictly because you're a disciple. You are now my friends. Because to my friends, I give the secrets of my kingdom. And I've given you the secrets of my kingdom. Can you hear me? A little bit here? I'll, I'll, I'll clarify this and begin to close this out in a moment here. I have more verses, but there's the verse... You know how we talk about friendship, like uh, a friend loveth at all times, but a brother is born for, anybody know that one? Adversity. Adversity. Do you know what that means? Friends won't challenge you the way you need to be challenged. You're like, why is he saying this now? This doesn't make any sense. He just said how friends are like everything. Because I always love how Revelation goes even deeper in the Bible. One verse is the stepping stone to the next verse. So that's, I think that's in Proverbs something. It's in Proverbs. And then another revelation comes in Proverbs that takes it even deeper. There is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Isn't that amazing? And then let's go even deeper. Like, faithful are the wounds of a friend. And in the midst of all of this, what you begin to see, Jesus does all of these things, by the way. He starts out as like this relational movement with these guys where they don't know him that well, but they want to. And he begins to move with them and get closer and closer to the point where he can look at Peter and say, get behind me, Satan. That's a friend. Now, if you think that's like license to go say that to all your friends, you might be screwed up and you might not be like Jesus. Remember, we only see Jesus doing it once. But there was something that was built up between him and Peter that he got to the point where he's like, get behind me, Satan. You don't know what kingdom you're a part of. You want to be a part of my kingdom and you keep living in your own. I'm going to call you forth into your destiny. I'm going to call your crap out and then I'm going to say, come with me further, Peter. I'm going to build my church on you. Are you guys capturing me with this? And so I need to do this in two parts, man. I can't even get into all the other fun stuff. In church, I don't want to do a discipleship program. I mean, I do, but it needs to look like Jesus. It needs to be not me getting you guys in here with pre-planned out notebooks that say, this is what a disciple is. And to be a disciple, you need to do this, 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 and this. And then when you're done, I'm going to give you a certificate, and you can be a full-fledged vanguard disciple now because you did the course. Do you feel like a disciple? No? We did everything in the book? No. That's like total fail. What I want to see is I want to see us coming to the place where we say, what does it mean to begin to get my 12? Actually, it's more than 12. When you include the women, it was probably like 20. No joke. Well, so maybe you could put 15 to 20. What do I do to begin to find my 20? And then what do I do to begin to get to the place where I want to lay my life down for these people. It's easy to lay your life down in the sense of like, like you know what's right to do. It's a whole other thing when your heart lines up with what's right. I can go out there and I can see a fight at the mall. If there's a fight at the mall, you know who's getting in the middle of it? I will. 
I had problems, man. I remember I was watching this one guy start to get beat down on Monroe Avenue in Rochester, and I'm like whipping the car over, trying to jump out, be like, no, this isn't right. <laughs> the guy probably would have beat me to a pulp, this huge dude with these shoulders, he's beating on this little guy. It was not good, and I probably would have gotten beat to a pulp, but he got scared because people were starting to notice, and he took off. But the point being is I knew that was right, Was there like some deep love of mine for that poor dude getting beat down? No. I wish I could say yes. But for me, it's justice. My name, Justin, justice. That's not just. So I'll go after justice, whether my heart is connected to the person or not. And that's what I'm saying is I want to get to the place where we move with one another so much that our heart connects with the person, that we are at that place where we're like, I don't call you a servant beside me, just doing God's work in the house. I call you a friend, and I would lay my life down for you. There's so much more. We're going to have to end there. There's so much more I want. I have, like, all these details, like, I'd love to go through. What does it look like to be a friend like Jesus? What does it look like to begin to pursue friendships in that capacity? Like, there's so much more. Maybe I will do that next time I speak, because it is, it is 12 o'clock. So this is not quite where I wanted to land this, but I want to, I'll leave it at this piece for you. Begin to ask God, what does friendship with you look like? Please, just that question. Begin to to mull on it. If that's the one thing you take away from today, begin to ask him, what does friendship with you look like? Like when you look at his disciples, how many guys eventually got to get up onto the mountain with him and see Elijah and Moses? Three, that was a secret that was revealed to his closest friends. Like for me, I'm like, I'm gonna be a Peter, James, and John. I don't care what it takes. I will step on you to become like Peter, James, and John up on the mountain. And Jesus is like, I'm handing you all my secrets. Jesus didn't step on anybody, so I shouldn't shouldn't say that. But I mean, like, shouldn't we be fighting to get as close to Jesus as we humanly can? He's not out here to govern your every move and to tell you what's right and wrong. Like, this is another crazy statement that's probably going to be like, people are going to be like, is that theologically correct? But I'll leave you with this one. God came to earth looking for friends. That was his goal, one of them, one of the major ones. How many friends did God have in the Old Testament that we know of? Any takers? Who knows their Bible? Who knows their Bible? I got, I got one and two. One very well everybody knows about uh, because he's called it. Another one, little discreet passage in there is Abraham. So there's two, Moses and Abraham. So God calls two people his friend in the entire Old Testament. Not even David gets that one. And then guess how many people Jesus calls his friends like right before he goes to die? Like 20 people-ish, those closest disciples to him. Jesus is like, I did it. I got some friends for us. I know, I'm, I'm like simplifying this probably a little too much. Jesus came looking for friends. I want to be one of them. Okay? It's open door to everybody. Sometimes in church, we've screwed this thing up so much, and we're like, this is what you got to do to be close to God. You ain't got to do nothing except forgive your yes and then begin to listen. Am I making some sense here? Now get on your knees right now and repent before Jesus for ever making him anything else but that. <laughs> Why don't you guys stand with me? So that was half the message. We'll get to the other half in a few weeks. Just remember it. Remember those pieces of it. Um, so, who wants to be a friend of God, huh? Like, if you haven't got your hand raised, we're going to pray for you right now. I'm not praying for everybody that wants to be a friend of God. I'm praying for all the people that don't want to be a friend of God. I'm kidding, kind of, not really. I'm taking your names as I saw the hands go up and those who didn't. I'm like, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for But I want to be a friend of God. I like, this has become something where I'm like, I don't just want to be the bride. I want to be the bride that like, is desperately in love with him. I don't want to just be the son or the daughter that is like a servant in the house. I want to be the son or the daughter that's like, oh man, my dad's my closest friend. Or my mom's my closest friend. Huh? Or a punk kid in the kingdom, whatever. We're not going there. So I, so I encourage you, like the greatest end of every relationship or the greatest fruit of every relationship will be friendship. 
And I didn't see that with that verse. That's why I never understood that. No greater love has a man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. No greater love, if you want to paraphrase that, super simple, no greater love has a man than like deep, intimate friendship. Yeah? We good with that? Okay. If you want to. You know our receiving position. It's like this is the position kids come in on Christmas morning where they're like, Mom, Dad, what you got for me? I'm like, I'm going to fill your arms up with what I got for you, kid. So let's, let's get in that position. So Jesus, Holy Spirit, Father, I just say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Bring us into revelation. Bring us into your truth. Yeah, we say thank you. And repeat this after me if you want to with me. Jesus, Jesus. I want to know what being your friend is like. I want to know how to do that. I want to know how to get as close to you as I can. Show me what kind of friend you are. Show me how you love. Show me how you have loved me. I want to be a friend of God. Amen. That's it. So worship, prayer team, they're both technically because they worship. But prayer team is up here if you want some prayer. Be friendly today to the people around you before you go. Just a thought. Maybe you'll find some new friends he's pointing you towards. Don't forget to